and 38 war elephants across the Alps. His target was Rome. There are any number of easier ways of invading Italy than going over the Alps. It's, you know, it's the least likely option. In 218 BC, there were only two military superpowers in the known ancient world. To the north, the mighty Roman Empire. To the south, the great empire of the Carthaginians ranged across North Africa. War had been raging for decades as they vied for control of the valuable trade routes through the Mediterranean. In a bid to destroy Rome once and for all, Hannibal devised a bold plan. Bringing his invasion force over the highest mountains in the known world. I'm used to mountains, but these are just awesome. John Naylor is an expert in ancient military tactics and equipment, as well as an experienced ex-forces climber. He's only been on the mountain a few minutes, and he's already discovering the magnitude of Hannibal's achievement. Even with modern equipment and modern clothing, the Alps can be a deadly place. You've got precipices you can step off and fall thousands of feet to your death. Rocks that block you away from landslides. This is a daunting, terrifying place. Not where I'd like to bring an army. Therein lies the mystery. How did Hannibal's army cross the snowy peaks? We're not really sure what sort of equipment the Carthaginians would have had, but we've got lots of Roman references to the sort of equipment that was available at the time. Researchers have to use their imagination. It's unlikely that the Romans had something which the Carthaginians didn't know about, or vice versa. And so we can assume that within the parameters of that kind of relationship, the equipment will be essentially similar. The investigation must continue more than a thousand kilometers to the south in Rome. Home of the Colosseum, the Vatican, and literally thousands of ancient buildings and monuments. On one of these monuments, the Arch of Constantine, researchers have discovered a tiny fragment of evidence. It shows a piece of equipment strapped to the feet of a soldier. The device looks exactly like a modern crampon. The crampon is a spiked device that attaches to the bottom of a boot, allowing modern climbers to gain purchase on snow, ice and rocks. This evidence suggests that the ancients may have had them too. Boots. These are the Roman caligae, the marching boots. They've got hobnails in to protect them on the stones, on the rocks, stop them wearing out too quickly. Crampons. They're based on some from the Arch of Constantine. They're described in Roman accounts as spy boots. John is hoping to discover how effective this ancient device is. With this sort of gear, maybe Hannibal's troops could have conquered this mountain. So we've got to come here and test it. Pierre, an experienced alpine climber, ensures John's safety rope is secure before he attempts the tricky climb up the icy cliff. Will the Roman spy shoes give John enough grip to get to the top? Grazie. <laughs> that was surprisingly easy. When I first got the references to these spy shoes, I was very skeptical. But they really do work. Um, especially on that difficult transition of snow to rock. They were able to give me that extra little bit of traction which in just leather boots, I wouldn't have stood a chance. I wouldn't have liked to have tried it without the safety rope and Pierre, but the Carthaginians could have done it. John has climbed the Alps using 2,000-year-old technology. The prototypes of the equipment special forces still use today. Hannibal did manage to get over these Alps, and we've shown that with the most rudimentary equipment, it's possible. With determination and grit, his men were real men, real soldiers. But then he faced the ultimate barrier. There were some passes that were simply unclimbable. The ancient texts record that as Hannibal descended the Roman side of the Alps, he was confronted with a massive precipice which he couldn't pass. The invasion was on the brink of disaster, but then his engineers proposed a remarkable solution. They would destroy the very rock of the mountain, 
using a violent chemical formula. The high-tech chemical labs of the 21st century produce compounds so complicated it would take this entire hour to list the ingredients of just one of them. But there is evidence from the Roman writer Livy that ancient armies had a much better understanding of the power of chemistry than we might expect. And they applied this on a huge scale. For example, on whole mountainsides. In 232 BC, the Carthaginian general Hannibal successfully led an invasion force over these huge mountains using equipment still used by climbers today. But then he got stuck. Hannibal finds that his way down off the mountain is obstructed by a huge block of stone. How can he get through this? He can't go around it and he can't go back. His army's going to starve to death. Modern historians believe the blocked route to have been either the Clapier Pass or the Traversetti Pass, both standing at around 2,400 metres. Livy tells us that a recent landslide had converted an already awkward spot into a perpendicular drop of nearly 90 metres, a limestone rock face that was completely impassable. Hannibal's first thought was to turn back, but according to Livy, the path behind them had turned to an ice sheet that the army's animals couldn't cross. Hannibal had to press on. Today, engineers use dynamite to blast pathways and mega machines to smash their way through obstacles. Hannibal used heat and ingenuity. Now, rock's hard. If you heat it, it expands. If you cool it rapidly, it contracts. And that expansion and dramatic contraction causes it to shatter and break. In this state, I can't do anything with it. But if I heat it and cool it rapidly, it becomes what we call friable. It's softer, crumbly, easier to break through. Now, the way to test it is we're going to heat up a small sample first using a blowtorch and then rapidly cool it using water. After 15 minutes, the limestone is red hot. I've got a high temperature thermometer here, digital thermometer, to see just what temperature the rock's up to. At 479 degrees, the addition of cold water will drop the rock temperature by 3,000% in just seconds. It's fizzing and boiling. Oh, amazing. That water's dried off in front of my eyes. Now let's see what effect it's had on the structure of the rock. To the naked eye, it doesn't look any different to before we started. But what's it really like? Let's see. Oh, amazing. It's soft, it's like chalk. I guess this is what they mean when they say the rock becomes friable. But Livy is very specific. He clearly states that Hannibal called for vinegar, not water. Uh, vinegar, salad dressing, um, doesn't sound very dangerous, does it? Uh, you get the impression, though, that Livy is as reliable as he can be, so I suspect there's more than a grain of truth in it. Perhaps the ancients understood the secrets of chemical reactions better than modern scientists give them credit for. There's a possible reason why you used vinegar instead of water. Limestone's alkali, vinegar's acid. That means it's chemistry as well as physics. 3D analyst James Dean has been researching Livy's claim at a molecular level. If we zoom in, we can see that the key components in the reaction here are an acid and a base. In this example, the base is the rock, which is limestone, calcium carbonate, and the acid is the vinegar or acetic acid. This falls into a common class of reaction known as an acid-base reaction. If we can push the two together to start the reaction off, we can see that straight away the acid has released hydrogen ions, which are combining with the oxygen and hydrogen from the base to form H2O, or water. Uh, the remaining components combine together to form a salt, which we can see here. The whole reaction is exothermic, and it's giving off a lot of heat. So we can see that if we look back at the wider scale, the heat is heating the water and it's producing steam, which we can see coming off it. There's other gases produced if you've got carbon involved, which will give us carbon dioxide. 
that will give us the effervescence and bubbling. And overall, the entire structure of the rock has been destroyed. The salt and water now permeate it. And if we touch it, it's completely friable. For Hannibal, this was no chemistry experiment. It was a matter of life and death. Hannibal was facing the ultimate on pass. Just like now, night's falling, the temperature's dropping, his army is about to freeze to death and die with no way down to those fertile plains below. He's got to get away through the rock. We're going to attempt it now. Big fire on here, heat the rock up with this fire, and then we'll try the vinegar and see whether we can make this rock friable enough to bash our way through and get down onto the plains. I've got the fire started, now I need bigger sticks, logs, get this into a big raging inferno. Not only was this a huge 90 metre expanse of rock, but a very dangerous precipice as well. The fire would have been enormous, the progress painstaking, as Hannibal's men slowly worked their way down the rock face, creating a path for the animals. The temperature of the rock is now 1,200 degrees, but is this high enough to accelerate the acid-base reaction? That is really hot. It's taking all the fur off my face, but I need to be able to get close enough to get the vinegar on. The size of the obstacle would probably have needed 75,000 litres of vinegar, but where would this vast amount come from? Hannibal's troops would each have had a daily sour wine ration of around quarter of a litre. The huge army would still have had almost 80,000 litres of wine vinegar with them. Oh boy, look at that boiling off there. It smells disgusting. I can see the rock cracking in front of my eyes. It's boiling and steaming in here. The acid of the vinegar. It's burning the back of my throat. <coughs> I'm learning every moment that I'm doing this. It's as if this rock has become an organic living thing that's complaining about the treatment we've given it. Oh, I love the way that breaks. It's not a boulder anymore, is it? It's just a loose conglomeration of pebbles. Like John, Hannibal's men used picks to smash through the limestone, enabling them to open up a zigzag track that minimised the gradient, thus allowing the pack animals and elephants to descend. After four days of hard work and near starvation, Hannibal had blasted his way through the Alps. That's got to be one of the most successful experiments I've ever done for ancient discoveries. Mountains you think of as the immovable object. Hannibal did it with some sticks, some salad dressing, some hard work and ingenuity. Absolutely staggering. Hannibal ploughed down through Italy towards Rome and inflicted the severest losses the Roman army ever suffered in its entire history. But although coming over the Alps gave him the element of surprise, it ultimately led to the Carthaginians' downfall. It's ironic that Hannibal used the best technology available to him to, to do this insurmountable task of getting an army over these mountains. But in that, he didn't have the capability to bring his heavy equipment with him. When it came to taking the towns through fortifications without siege machines, which he couldn't bring over these mountains, he was on a hopeless task. Technology allowed him to get there, but then the door was slammed in his face. Machines such as the carbon flamethrower, the catapults and other siege engines were too important to have been left behind, and Hannibal's campaign failed. He doesn't attack cities, he doesn't capture places. Rome is there and he doesn't attack it. Whether learning from failure or through spectacular successes, the engineers of the ancient world were no different from those of today. Ancient engineers faced exactly the same problems as we face today. You're wanting to go faster and carry more, but use less natural resources in terms of making it and then want it to perform for a long time once it's constructed. 